That's why we are here. But this Sunday is traditionally what we call Palm Sunday. And it is on this Sunday that we remember that Jesus Christ came into the city of Jerusalem. And that last week of his life we call the Holy Week or the Passion Week of Jesus. And in just a few days' time we see the Israelites go from worshiping Jesus to wanting to kill Jesus. Because the people who were shouting Hosanna to Jesus on Sunday, the first week, were the same people who were shouting crucify him five days later. And in doing so, they demonstrated that they were not true disciples of Jesus. Because a true disciple is one who continually commits to Jesus. And next week as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Personally, I don't celebrate Easter as being greater than any other Sunday. And that, that may sound like heresy. <laughs> but why are we here today? Why are we here on Sunday? Because Jesus resurrected from the grave on Sunday. And so every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. And so sometimes I think by elevating Easter we can lower every other Sunday. And what we end up what we end up doing is saying Christianity is spent on very high moments instead of all of the time. And perhaps it's the same here, but in America, churches are packed on Easter. But the rest of the year there is plenty of room for everyone. Because we as a culture have highlighted one day rather than a lifetime committed to Jesus. So I want us to focus on a couple of parables today that demonstrate the necessity of always being ready for Jesus. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for our time together today. God, I praise you for the life of Jesus. Father, as we reflect today on his last week of his life here on earth prior to his crucifixion, I pray that your spirit would draw us into relationship with you. God, that we would see dedication to Jesus as a necessity and mandatory for each moment of our lives and not simply certain days of the year. So God, I pray that you would help us as we study your word today, that your spirit would guide and lead into the truth. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Jesus came into Jerusalem on Sunday. And on that Sunday, people laid their coats down and palm leaves on the road for the donkey to walk across. And as Jesus proceeded into the city, they worshipped him and said, Hosanna to, to Jesus. They were praising Jesus. And the religious leaders who were angry at Jesus said, tell these people to stop. And Jesus replied, if these people are quiet, even the rocks will cry out. And that began a week of teaching of Jesus in the temple and other locations. We pick up with this idea in Matthew chapter 21. 
Matthew 21 records the story of the triumphal entry, as we call it. And much of the entire gospel of John is dedicated to this one week of Jesus' life. But whereas many of the gospels will kind of jump through Jesus' life, we see this one week laid out in a long, in many verses. And so starting in Matthew chapter 21, all the way to later chapters, actually the end of Matthew until he read, until Jesus is uh, ascended, this is all the last week of Jesus' life, from Matthew 21 all the way to 28. And so today we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 22 and Matthew chapter 25. Both of these parables that Jesus says are probably on the same day, on Tuesday of that week. Jesus enters into the city on Sunday. We're today going to be discussing Tuesday of that week. And Jesus is crucified on Friday. By tradition. And then he resurrects the following Sunday. So in the in the course of Jesus teaching, he tells this parable from Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 through 14. Let's read that please. Yesu yongera kuvugana nabo abacira imigani ati ubwami bwo mwijubugereranwa n'umwami wacyujije ubukwe bw'umwana we arongora atuma aba abagaragu we guhamagara abatorewe gutaho ubukwe banga kuza arongera atuma abandi bagaragu ati mubwire abatowe muti dore niteguye amazimano amapfizi yanje ninka zibyibushye babibaze byose byitegwe muze ngubukwe Maze abo ntibabyitaho barigendera umwe ajya mu gikingi ke undi ajya mu rutundo rwe abasigaye bafata ama abagaragu we barabashinyagurira barabica maze umwami ararakara agabingaboze arimbura aho bicanye atwika imidugudu ya maze abwira abagaragu be ati ubukwe bwiteguwe ariko abari babutorewe nti bari babukwiye nuko mu nuko Mujye mu nzira nyabageno abo muri abo mujye mu nzira abo muri boneyo bose mu bahamagare baze bataho ubukwe aho bagaragwa barasoka bajya mu nzira bateranya aho babonye bose ababi nabeza inzu yo gucyurizamo yubukwe yuzura abasangwa umwami yinjiye kureba abasangwa abonamo umuntu utamba uyu mwenda w'ubukwe Aramubaza ati mugenzi wanjye niki gitumye winjira hano utambaye umwenda w'ubukwe na warahora rwose maze umwami abwira abagaragu be ati ni mubohe amaboko n'amaguru mu mujugunye mu mwijima hanze niho bazarira bagaye kinyira amenyo kuko abatowe ari benshi ari kabatoranyijwe bakaba bake amen Here we see this parable that Jesus told of a king who was giving a celebration feast and it wasn't just any celebration. It was a wedding feast. And not just any wedding feast. A feast for his son. And the king invites the whole country to come to the wedding. This, is, this was standard in the ancient world. When a king would throw a banquet, he would send out invitations far and wide. And he would want everyone to come and celebrate with him. And the country would go through periods of celebration with everybody involved. And so we have this picture here of this king. As you know, parables typically represent something. 
So this king is representing God the Father. And he's prepared a wedding for his son, Jesus. So he sends his servant out, servants out to, to invite, to bring those who have been invited. But look with me at verse 3. It says, those who were invited did not want to come. See, God had invited the children of Israel to be in his family. He invited, invited them to come to the banquet. But they didn't want to come. And so look at verse 4. It says, Then the king said to the servants, Bring the children of Israel that are invited to the banquet. He sends out more servants to bring. says, No, they need to come. Bring them. In order to, and also to show them that he was serious, he told them, Look, everything is ready. It's, it's not like he was saying, come, we're going to eat tomorrow. He wasn't talking about five Rwandan minutes. Right? The food was ready. They were to come and experience the joy of the banquet right now. He said, he's already killed the animals. The food is literally on the table. And so you need to come right now. But look at verse 5. So remember, he sent out his servants and said, those who are invited need to come. But they didn't want to. And so he goes and sends more servants and says, no, the matter is urgent. You should come now. And when they sent this, when the second set of servants went to come out, look what happens. They don't even pay attention. One goes to the farm. Another one goes to work in his business. And as a result, they show complete indifference to the servants. And let's continue on with how they treated the servants. So they they grab the other the other people who don't ignore the slaves are even or servants are even angrier. No, no, so, so some people just ignore them. They make excuses why they cannot come to the banquet. But others are violent. Others persecute the servant. They grab them. They beat them. And they even killed them. And if we remember the story of Mark in Mark 12 that Jesus tells the parable of the man who owned the vineyard. There, the owner of the vineyard had sent servants to tell the people to begin to pay. And those people beat the servants. So the, kid, so the owner of the vineyard sends his son. But the people in the vineyard, they kill the son. And Jesus explains that because of that, the vineyard is taken away and given to other people. And we see a very similar message here. So look how the king's attitude in verse 7. So the king was enraged. He sent out his soldiers and destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. And his actions are just. If we're talking about the vineyard owner, just one passage earlier in Matthew chapter 21. We see the same attitude. I said Mark 12, but we also have it here in Matthew 21. 
He says in verses 33 through 40, he tells this in verse 40, he says, When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those farmers? Verse 41, he will completely destroy them. And give his vineyard to other farmers. And so we see the same imagery here in chapter 22. That the king has invited special people to come to his wedding. But they reject the invitation. And some of them turn violent toward the people who are announcing him. And so as a result, there is space available. Because remember, the food is already ready. It has already been prepared. People can just come and eat. So look at verse 8. So he tells his servants, the banquet is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. And as a result, the king does something drastic. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. Then the king commanded his servants, Go outside the city. Go to the street corners. Go to the street corners. Go to the roads connect. Go to Nyabugogo and find all the people waiting for buses. <laughs> right? This is what he is saying. Where the people gather to be able to move and be transported, go to that busy spot and grab all of those people. They weren't the ones that were originally invited, but the table is ready and people are going to enjoy this. And so verse 10, the servants go out to the roads and gather everyone they found. Both. Yeah. And the banquet was filled with guests. And so we see this generosity of this king. That the people whom he had invited at first didn't want to come. And rather than simply just leave the food for wasting. The king says, bring other people who will now enjoy what I have prepared. And remember the imagery that Jesus is connecting us to. These are the Israelites. The people had received his servants in the prophets. And they had beaten those prophets. They had ignored the prophets. They had even killed the prophets. And as a result, Jesus said in the parable in chapter 21 that that kingdom would be taken away from them and given to somebody else. And so in this imagery, God. God was calling the Jews to himself, but they rejected him, and now he's calling the Gentiles. Let's read on and see more about this king. Let's read verse 11. So the king comes in to greet all of the people who have come from outside the city to his banquet. Then when he comes, he sees a man who has come and clearly is not dressed for a wedding. And most people who study this passage explain that this king was the one who was helping people become dressed for the wedding. In that culture, you had to wear specific clothing to a wedding. In most cultures, if you show up to a wedding in the same clothes that you were out here digging in the dirt, you would be looked down upon. Right? That's not what we wear to a wedding. And so the king here was was providing the proper clothing to his guests. All of the people who were outside the city at the intersections, he brought them in. 
abantu bose bari bari hiryo ngiyo mu mihanda yabazanye mu And as he brought them in he gave them the clothing they needed to wear to the wedding. Aba bantu bose ro yazanye abahe myambaro ibakwiye kugira ngo So he comes to this person who is not dressed for the wedding. Nuko asa umuntu asanga atambaye myenda yo. And there's probably only one explanation. This particular person had rejected the king's provision. This person had not decided to take what the king had offered. <laughs> so he thought that he could enter the wedding based upon his own his own apparel. And the king says to him in verse 12. Aramubaza ati mugenzi wanje n'iki gitumye winjira hano utambaye mwenda wo gukwe First he refers to him as friend Aramubaza mugenzi wanje n'inshuti Because at the first invitation he was his friend Kuko nawe atumira abantu uyu mwami uyu nawe yarari mu yatumira inshuti The king was gracious to him Yagiye mugira ibu nawe aramutumira And the king continues to speak to him in this way But when he says, how did you get in here without clothing? The man has no response. Because there was nothing he could say that could make it right. He had been offered the solution to his problem. And he had rejected it. And so there was nothing he could say. Because he was responsible. And so as a result the king tells his servants to tie this man up by hand and foot. And he gets thrown out of the party into the darkness. The Bible says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see this phrase multiple times in Jesus' parable. This represents a grief that cannot be consoled. There is nothing that can be done to calm this person's Uh, sorrow. And he says in verse 14, many are invited but few are chosen. We could study verse 14 for a long time but that's not the point, that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is this person who has come to the wedding unprepared. Let's connect this to the gospel. So God has prepared a banquet for all of us. And in his preparation, everything is ready. And God did indeed send prophets to the people of Israel. And he invited them to have a relationship with him. He desired a covenant with them. And they even had said, yes, we will obey it. But immediately after saying they would obey God's covenant, they made the golden covenant. For the next several centuries, we see the Israelites being continually drawn to God, but continually ignored. And ultimately, because of their inability to respond to God's call, he sends Jesus, and that message can go to the world. And so you and I represent the We are represented by the people who are out outside the city. And we have been invited in now. But see, there's only one way that we can access God's banquet. The table that God has prepared represents salvation. But see, this man who had come to the banquet came in his own clothing. The king had offered him the proper clothing which was needed for entry into the banquet. But when he rejected the proper clothing, he rejected his opportunity for access. And this represents the sinner. The sinner who has access to God the Father in one way alone. 
This is through the righteousness of Jesus. In Romans 3 verses 21 through 26, we have this picture of the propitiation that Jesus offers us. That Jesus takes our place. That Jesus stands where we deserve God's wrath and takes that wrath for us. And because of that sacrifice, he covers our sin. And he clothes us with his righteousness. And Jesus' righteousness, which we receive in salvation, is the only way to have access to God. But see, this man who entered into the banquet did not have the proper faith. And so the person who comes to Jesus with his own righteousness will be tossed out into outer darkness. And so we've been looking at, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the, the Sermon on the Mount. And we come to the end of that in chapter 7. And Jesus says that anybody who hears his words will be like a wise man who builds his house on the, on the rock. But the foolish man builds his house on sand. And so when we think of our, our own Christian lives, the things that Jesus had said in Matthew 7 have to represent us. When Jesus says the person who hears these words, he re he's referring to everything he has just preached. And one of the things that Jesus has just said in Matthew 7 is that not everyone who says to me, Lord, will enter the kingdom. But only the one who does the will of God. So Jesus says, not everyone will enter God's kingdom. And if you are wise, you'll understand what that means. And several years later, Jesus tells this parable. And he says the same thing in a different way. This time he says, if you come to the banquet wearing the wrong clothes, you will be thrown out. Because the only way to access God the Father is by surrendering to Jesus Christ. And so God in His grace has offered each of us the opportunity to put on the righteousness of Jesus. And through Jesus, we have access into God's provision, which is salvation. And so Jesus begins the rest of that Day, teaching more. And in fact, many times the Sadducees and the Pharisees try to trap Jesus over the course of that day. They ask him silly questions about who will get married in, in the afterlife. He said, and he calls out woes or judgment on the Pharisees. He tells of the destruction of the temple, the persecution that will come. And then he talks about faithfulness to the Messiah in chapter 24. And he gives several parables which tell the same idea. Starting in verse 36. He begins to talk about no one knowing when Jesus will return. And he talks to them about we have to be faithful like a servant who does not know when his master is coming back. So he tells another parable talking about being ready for the return. And I want to help, I want us to help I want to help us connect these two parables. Let's read chapter 25 now, verses 1 through 13. Aravuga ngo icyo gihe ubwami bwo mu ijuru buzageramo n'abakobwa 10 bajyanye amatabaza yabo bajya gusanganira umukwe ariko muri abo 10 abatano barabapfa abandi batano barabanyabwenge abapfu bajyanye amatabaza yabo 
ntibajyana n'amavuta ariko abanyabwenge bo bajyana amavuta mu mperezo zabo hamwe n'amatabaza ya umukwe atinze bose baramunikira barasinzira ariko nijoro mu gicuku habaho rusaka ngo umukwaraje ni musoke mu busanganire maze baba kuvuga bose barahaguruka baboneza amatabaza ya abapfu babwira abanyabwenge bati ni muduhe ku mavuta yanyu kwa matabaza yacu azima ariko abanyabwenge baraha barabahakanira bati oya ntidukwi ntaya ni yadukwira twese ahubwo ni mujye mu bahajuzi muyigurire bagiye kugura umukwe araza abari biteguye binjirana nawe mu bukwe urugero rurakingo hanyu baba bakobwa bandi nabo baraza barahamagara batinya kubako dukingurira nabo arabasubiza ati ndababwira ukuri uko ntabaze nuko muwe maso uko mutazi umunsi cyangwa gi amen here we see another parable that Jesus explains the kingdom of heaven. And he relates it to ten bridesmaids. Ten women who help serve in the wedding party. And so we need to know a little bit of, about weddings in this culture. Typically, the, the woman did not exactly know that the time that the wedding was going to begin. I, I don't know about you ladies, but that would not work in America. Like if you thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll get married today, maybe I'll get married tomorrow, I don't know. Like, that would not be very good. Right? But in this culture, the wedding wasn't necessarily announced a long time in advance. They knew approximately when it would happen. But we see these ten women who are waiting. And normally the groom would begin with his other groomsmen at his own house. And there would be a big parade going to the girl's house. And when they found the bride at her house, they would then take her back to the groom's house where the big party would be. Most of the time this happened at night. So after the, the day they would all the groom would get his people ready they would go get the woman and bring him back bring her back to his house. And so we see this idea of these these ladies who have lamps a better word would maybe be a torch. Right? Did you use like a torch like a flashlight torch? <laughs> it would be fire. <laughs> So they would have they would have a torch that would need oil to burn. Because they, there weren't street lights. Right? And so they would have to carry their torch with them through the road on with the fire lighting their way. And so typically they would be filled with olive oil. And it would be like a rag that they would light on fire, like a piece of cloth. And, when, and when, the, when the oil was gone, they would have to use pour more oil on that cloth to burn. Well, because they did not know when the groom was coming, they didn't, they didn't know how much they had to burn. And so in this story, we have five women who had brought extra oil with them. And we have five who did not. The Bible doesn't say anything about if the they are saved or unsaved. It just calls them wise and foolish. Because that is the picture, being wise. So the, the ones that were wise had extra oil for themselves. And for whatever reason, the groom takes forever to come. And they all fall asleep. And as they're sleeping, suddenly they hear the party coming. The groom and his, his friends are coming. And then the shout from the party says, the groom is here, come out. So, so the girls all get up. 
and they, tr- they trimmed the, the cloth to light their lamp but the ones who did not bring enough oil their lamps would not light because all their oil was already used and so they look at the ones who have extra oil and say give us, give us some give me some of your oil that you brought with you and the ones who had brought it they said we, no if we give you oil then we won't have it and we'll all be walking and all of our torches will go out right instead of having five torches that would last the whole way they would have ten torches that lasted half of the way and so they tell them like this is not our fault so you need to go out and buy oil but nothing's open this is the middle of the night it's hard for them to find the oil that they need and so they're gone when the groom comes and so those whose lamps are lit are able to go with the groom and the others are out banging on doors trying to find the oil and so those who are ready went in with the groom this is verse 10 to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. So later the rest of the women show up. And they bang on the door, Master, open for us. In verse 12, he replies, I assure you, I do not know you. Therefore, this is the point of the parable, be alert. Because you don't know the day or the hour. Let me connect chapter 7, chapter 22, and chapter 25. In chapter 7, Jesus says, There will be many who come to me and say, Lord, did, didn't we do all of these things? And he will say, I, I don't know you. Depart from me. He says, The only ones that I know are the ones who do my will. In the will of God, if we look at John chapter 6, these are the works that God wants is that we believe in Jesus. And so if we look at the king in chapter 22, that king invited everybody to come. And they ignored him. And they beat his servants. And they killed them. And so as a result, he invites other people. But the only way that you could have access into the banquet is to wear the proper clothing. In chapter 7, Jesus says the only way to enter the kingdom is to do God's will. We know that the works of God are to believe in Jesus. And so he says in chapter 22 that the only way to come to the banquet is to wear the right clothing. And that clothing is the righteousness of Jesus that gives us access to God the Father. We see this in Romans chapter 5. That because of Jesus we have peace with God the Father. And by him we obtain obtained access into the grace of God. And we see in Hebrews chapter 6 that Jesus has entered the presence of God as a forerunner on our behalf. And so in, in this parable of 22, we see that the only way to truly be welcomed into the presence of God is to have the right clothing. But we see from the Old Testament that all of our own righteousness is as a polluted or filthy And in our sin, we are like that man who tries to enter into the banquet of God with our own righteousness. And so in our condition, the king, just like the king had no choice but to throw that man out, God has no choice but to throw us out of his presence. Because it doesn't matter what we say. It matters what we wear. 
Because we must wear the righteousness of Jesus. So this is chapter 7. We can't, it doesn't matter what we say, it matters what we do. In chapter 22, he says, you can come, but you must come the way that I say. And then we come to chapter 25 and we have another picture. That these young women had to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. And he says that we must, in verse 13, he says we must be alert because you don't know the day or the hour. We have no idea when Jesus will return. The Bible actually says that it's impossible for us to know the hour. We don't know. And the only way for us to be ready when Jesus comes is to always be ready. If we, are, if we are ready today but not ready tomorrow, that doesn't count. In fact, that's not even really possible. I can't be saved today and not saved. Today. But the only way for me to be accepted into God's presence is to be ready wearing the righteousness of Jesus. Nothing that I can do can prepare me for God's return. The only thing that will prepare me for the coming of Jesus is Jesus himself. But the beauty of this is that I don't have to prepare myself. Jesus is willingly offered and freely offered to all of us. The righteousness or the clothing which is required for God's presence is a gift. Just like this king provided the right clothing to his guests, God provides the right righteousness to us. And by wearing the righteousness of Jesus is the only way that we can be ready for the return of Jesus. And I know many of you in here. I've baptized many of you. But I don't know everybody. And I don't know everybody online. But if you have not trusted in the righteousness of Jesus as your access to God the Father, you don't actually have access. We live in a culture that pretends to have access to God. We likely have friends and family members who are trying to put on their own clothing to enter into God's banquet. And so as, as a so what for this message, I want to talk about two things. Number one, are you personally ready for the return of Jesus? Number one, are you personally ready for the return of Jesus? And the only way to be personally ready for the return of Jesus is to have the righteousness of Jesus. To believe in the gospel that Jesus is the only way for you to have life. Because as we've seen in these parables, the, the result of not having the right Clothing and righteousness is to be tossed out into darkness. And so we must all make that personal decision of being ready for the return. So that's one. Are you ready? Number two. Are you helping other people get ready? There are people in the world all around us who believe that they can come into God's presence with their own righteousness. They may say that directly or they may believe that 
ignorantly. And just like God sent out these servants to invite people to come to the banquet, He sends us out to invite people to come into His presence. And as is our custom this morning, we pray that God would give us boldness and mission. We prayed for specific missionaries by name. But we have all been given the ministry of reconciliation. And as a result, we are like those servants who go out into the busy markets and call people to repentance. Because we want people also to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. This is a serious matter. It's an exciting and glorious and joyful matter for those of us who are believers. But for those of us who have family members like myself who, who don't know Jesus, this is extremely weighty at the same time. And so we must demonstrate the joy of that banquet. And we must call people to be ready. So are you ready? And what are you doing to help others? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you so much that we have access by grace and faith alone in Jesus Christ and that when we, when we need your righteousness, it is freely given to us. And so, Father, I pray that if there are any who do not know what it means to trust in Jesus for salvation, any who are trusting in their own righteousness, that you would help them to understand that the only way, the only way to enter into the banquet to which you have called us is to wear the right garments which is provided through Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And Father, I also pray for those around us. Lord, for those who need your gospel, I pray that we would be agents to be able to share that, that testimony, to share that light. God, that you would use the young people in this group, that you would use me to share the gospel to a lost and a dying world because the most sobering reality in the world today is that people die and go to hell today. And Father, help us to be gripped by that. Father, grab our hearts for our loved ones, for our family members, for our friends, co-workers, fellow students. God, grip us with the reality that we do not know when Jesus will return and as a result we must personally be ready but we have also been given the ministry of reconciliation that calls other people to be ready too and God I pray that you would use us that we would glorify your name because of the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. Father that you would make much of your own kingdom here in Rwanda and across Africa and across the world that we would see more people come and be seated at the banquet which you have prepared and that the food is ready and the gospel is in front of them and they simply need to respond. And so, God, I pray for us as we share your word to call people to repentance. But, God, I pray most of all for us who are hearing my voice today to respond to the gospel. And if we have, God, I pray that we would rejoice in that. <clears throat> Father, thank you for our time together with you today. Thank you for our time of fellowship. Lord, I pray that your word would influence us and impact us throughout this week as we consider the sacrifice that you have made to purchase our redemption on the cross. God, I pray that we would rejoice in Jesus, that we would rejoice in your suffering because you understood the joy that was before you and you endured the cross despise the shame and now are seated at the right hand of the throne of God and we await your return. So Father, we thank you for that. And Jesus, we love you for that. Because you first loved us. So God, I pray that we would point people to the cross of Jesus this week. And that you would help us to be ready for your return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.